I don't like pain! Out of my way, please! Say night night! You're not gonna enjoy this! Push through the pain! In this video, I'd like to demonstrate a Vantage Oko build for Engage, featuring the Sage of the Four Winds, Gregory. While his speed is lacking for the popular Mage Knight build, Gregory has the highest magic stat in the game. Not only can he reach the incredibly high Oko thresholds of Maddening's late game, but he can do so while using an emblem that gives him more utility, rather than maximum damage stacking, always striking first with Vantage to kill everything before enemies have a chance to kill him. I'd like to show off how I utilize this in one of my playthroughs, but first, Let's take a look at how exactly the numbers work out for this rather demanding build. Technically, the earliest you can start a Vantage Sweep is Chapter 9, where most Oko thresholds fall a little over 40. By Chapter 16, we're up to the mid-60s, and endgame thresholds range from 90 to 100. On the player's end, an optimistic count shows that we can stack around 65 attack on anyone, with an extra 12 if we consider Instruct and Spirit Dusts. A big contributor is Veronica's Reprisal Plus skill, which converts your pain into the enemies, boosting damage by 50% of your missing HP. With Sage's HP cap of 43, that goes up to 48 with an HP tonic, a Sage at 1 HP can get up to 23 damage from Reprisal Plus. And if we're willing to inherit the skill, then we can get an extra 11 damage being synced with Korn, who provides 4 magic and 15 HP that translates to 7 Reprisal Plus damage. Combined with Sage's 9 base magic, a 20 might tome, and a magic tonic, this means personal magic is technically only necessary for reaching Oko thresholds by the mid-game. However, having over 30 attack from personal magic and other sources is needed for reaching late-game thresholds, and lets you get away with weaker emblem choices for various non-damage boosting benefits. In fact, Gregory has so much magic that he's able to dip all the way down to Camilla, who provides plus 3 damage from a plus 7 HP boost. This gives our Vantage Oko Sweeper with Ace Daves, plus 2 move, flight, an early Brave Tome, and an engage attack that can hit up to 12 enemies at once. This all sounds pretty crazy, so let's see how I put it together in an actual run. Gregory first appears in Chapter 3 of the Felzina Log, which serves as a trial run before taking him into the main campaign. It's fairly trivial to rush through the Felzina Log on normal mode to get him by Chapter 7, but I would like to mention some meaningful contributions I found he had on Maddening. His Fortify access was great for Chapter 3, where enemies are coming from all directions, Hector's quick repost technically lets him one round Chapter 3's flyers, and his personal skill, Survival Plan, in tandem with an augmented Seraphim, lets him dodge tank sweep Chapter 4's corrupted enemy spam. However, I also learned that Gregory has particularly low dex and will need hit boosting engraves once available. And of course, that Vantage is much more appealing than dodge tanking, if you can set it up. Because Gregory always takes his Fel Xenolog 3 status into the main campaign, I don't think I need to explain how much he can dominate the early game. I actually decided to hold him back for the sake of my other units, but I did invest in an early Bulganone so we could Oko problematic enemies up through the mid game. Once enemies started promoting is when I learned that I would need some huge damage stacking, since I had to resort to Dire Thunder and Excalibur effectivity to keep up with one rounds. The downsides of these options, of course, being that Dire Thunder is locked to player phase and needs a Might Engrave, leaving Gregory with low hit rates, and Excalibur only has a few relevant matchups. But for what it's worth, Lynn Paralog has the Wyvern Knights in the East that I had in Dodge Tank Sweep, and the Camilla Paralog has a ton of Griffin Knights that you need to quickly kill if you want to play the map upright and not get overrun by reinforcements. Once I retrieved the Camilla Bracelet and got a sense for her kit, I took to the drawing board and concocted my ultimate plan, using my many SP books from the Ancient Well to inherit Reprisal Plus going into Chapter 14. No Vantage just yet, but I had him warp Panette over the moat to sweep the north, then use Sword to fly himself over, taking damage from the heroes in the boss room, and getting some kills in the boss rush. I couldn't defeat Hortensia before she summoned reinforcements, but this was a perfect introduction to the power of Dark Inferno. Its range means it never hits adjacent enemies, but it's so big that it's still liable to hit multiple enemies in several enemy formations. You have to use an axe, but Camilla comes with the magical Bolt Axe, and the mystical tag's 20% damage boost means he can get the same Okos despite the Bolt Axe having less might than his Forge Bulganone. And for what it's worth, Camilla's other axe, the Camilla's axe, gives him a strong option even against high-res enemies that he otherwise might not be able to kill with a Bolt Axe. Turn 1 staff support into a boss group Dark Inferno proved to be a similar pattern in numerous future paralogues. 
This includes, but is not limited to, Soren's paralogue, rescuing Nell into range of all the Griffin Knights turn 1, before his Dark Inferno against Soren's group, Sigurd's paralogue, with a huge Dark Inferno against the many reinforcements, Micaiah's paralogue, warping Lapis to provide Etie bonded shield against the Great Knights, before using Dark Inferno to kill Micaiah at range with Camilla's axe, and Erika's paralogue, killing a few sages with the Camilla's axe, before defeating Erika herself. But of course, the highlight chapters were when I equipped Gregory with Vantage. I first had Advantage Sweep in Ike's Paralogue, following Chapter 14. With the Biothan Grave available, I could take Bulganone up to 120 hits, letting Gregory reach 100 hits against promoted enemies without losing any might. However, the Biothan Grave also gives 10 Avoid, which combined with Survival Plan made setting up Repisa Plus a little inconsistent. My solution was to start with an Ike Engraved Elfire, which was strong enough to sweep the enemies on the western path towards Ike, and then switch to the Bulganone for the rest of the map. The Elfire was enough to reach the highest generic Oko threshold of 68 against the Berserkers and Martial Master, and Bulgonon's higher might meant Gregory could also reach Ike's threshold of 75, getting all three kills over the course of turn 3 enemy phase, turn 4 player phase, and turn 4 enemy phase. Chapter 15 took him back to a more of a utility role, warping Alfred into the Western Room turn 1, and using Camilla's Vein of Flame to clear blocks of Miasma. His big Dark Inferno for the chapter only got one kill, but because Dark Inferno sets its target's tile on fire, it also cleared Miasma, setting up other units to finish the kills that he couldn't get. Then at the end, his high move let him rescue Lapis from across the wall, opening the final chest before I had Seedle escape turn 8. Fittingly, the Bile of Paralogue taught me a couple important lessons. I realized that enchanters can essentially provide holdout plus 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 for a unit by enchanting a meal from the mess hall. This means Gregory will always survive at 1 HP when he otherwise would reach 0. He's already wielding a heavy tome to ensure he gets hit, which in turn means Gregory is getting doubled by everything, so any one round of combat should set up full reprisal going forward if we can spare the action to enchant. With the full reprisal, he was able to Oko generic enemies on the western side of the map, with even a weak thunder being able to reach the Oko threshold for Swordmasters and the Elf Under Sages at 65. The other lesson I learned this chapter was to look out for Camilla's Groundswell skill, which clears the terrain off the tile you end on and heals 10 HP. And because the Vein of Flame places fire on your current tile, you're guaranteed to get Groundswell if you use the Vein of Flame, decreasing reprisal damage by 5. So instead of using the Vein of Flame to encourage Byleth to run towards the rest of my army, I had to use Dark Inferno instead, defeating one of the Habadir boss's health bars in the process. Gregory was then able to fly over to Byleth on the following turn, reaching his Oko threshold of 80 with Bulganone for a turn 7 victory. The next few chapters he went back to Utility, with his high move and flying rescue, letting Alfred get across Chapter 16 Shoals turn 1, and fight through the couple enemies in the north, as he flew to visit the Recover Village, in time for my 7 turn clear. For Chapter 17, I again needed his high move rescue, to help Anna get in range of Mavir's group turn 1. By standing adjacent to my Corrin user, he was upgraded to Dark Inferno Plus, for an absolutely obscene attack range against Marnie's group, setting up for my turn 5 routes. Then for chapter 18, his high move let him open the northwestern chest in my one turn clear, as I was in a rush to get to the much cooler chapter 19. In this map, I always look to sweep Mavir's group turn 1, forcing him to immediately rescue Marty. This is a little demanding, but Gregory gives us everything we need. With Soar, he can fly over the gap and flames set by the flame cannon, just needing one dance to get into position after setting up Vantage. With the Vein of Flame, he's able to clear the miasma around Mavir, letting us actually damage him on the following turns, while also denying all the generic enemies that attack into Gregory from having Miasma. Groundswell took him out of vantage range, but he was still able to survive one more attack, which set up for even more appraisal damage. He completely cleared the Royal Knight's Oko threshold of 73, but the extra damage would prove to be useful in reaching Mavir's threshold of 85 with a chain attack. Now, because Soar just gives Gregory flying movement rather than the actual flying class tag, he still has the Vein of Flame, so in clearing Miasma, he prevented several enemies from running up to attack him. However, this still effectively let my other units safely approach, setting me up to win the next turn. With Dark Inferno, he cleared out most of the remaining generic enemies, in addition to burning through one of Marnie's health bars, as Holdout does not apply to engage attacks. This did set a lot of terrain on fire and impede my movement, but with Dancing, Goddess Dance, and Rescue, I was still able to visit both villages and collect the rewards in time for my victory turn 3. In Chapter 20, he faced off against his other self, Gris. Gregory one-rounded Gris from his starting position, 
Then the two had a rather interesting fight at the end, in which Gris used Echo to attack Gregory twice. Gris's attacks and unholy stance powered Gregory up through reprisal, which in turn meant Gregory would take even more damage from unholy stance. But thankfully, Gregory's massive HP and resistance meant he came out on top, letting me kill Gris and get both chests by turn 5. Chapter 21 was again limited to a few key player phase kills, defeating the generals around Vale, then using Dark Inferno to defeat both a Vale health bar and the Karnwinen thief in my 4 turn clear. Up till now, I had held Gregory back in some maps, but going into the late game, I decided to let him demolish absolutely everything. Chapter 22 in particular was impressive, using Camilla to fly around and sweep the western and southeastern groups. Setting up Max Reprisal was a little inconsistent, but he was able to take just enough damage by the time he needed to reach the Oko thresholds. The first hit let him reach 77 attack in time for the Wolf Knights, and the damage from the Meteor Sage let Gregory reach 81 attack before the Wyvern Knights attacked him. Then by turn 3, he reached the southeast, weakening the High Priest on player phase so he could kill everything on enemy phase. Other than the High Priest at 86, the highest Oko threshold here is the Martial Master at 81, just like the Wyvern Knights, so he was also able to defeat the Habadir, Berserkers, and Great Knights. With that section cleared, he was safe to rescue Alir over to restore the final set of emblems, setting up for a turn 6 victory. In Marth's paralogue, I had Gregory take a detour into the chest room, using Rewarp to get in range of most every hero turn 1. With a meal enchant, he got max reprisal while surviving the mini-boss, letting him surpass the generic hero's Oko threshold of 86. He just had to weaken the mini-boss on turn 2 player phase so he could defeat them and the rest of the generic heroes on the enemy phase, setting up for a classic final turn Dark Inferno. It was strong enough to Oko the mini-boss, getting their 2000 gold, alongside an insane elixir that a thief was running away with. In the end, he got to kill almost every enemy in the west by the time everyone in the east defeated Marth turn 3. For the final Pact Ring paralogue, I had Gregory sweep the southern half. He actually didn't reach the Oko thresholds for the Warriors and Shielding Art High Priests at 96 and 98 respectively, but I realized I could further boost Bulgadon's Might by 5 by enchanting a separate copy, which just barely let him get the kills. It took a couple turns to burn through all four of the hero boss's health bars between player and enemy phase, but I was ultimately able to rout by turn 9. Chapter 23 was another incredible experience, as Gregory led the northeastern section of the map for a turn 3 route. I got him to the center turn 1, killing the Corrupted Worm on player phase while setting up Reprisal, then sweeping the Wyvern Knights, Mage Knights, Wolf Knights, and Sword Masters. The Oko threshold to reach here was 83 for the Wyvern Knights, with the Wolf Knights being pretty close at 80, and the Mage Knights and Sword Masters at 78. At this point, I had switched to an Erika Engrave, providing 40 hits and minus 20 avoid without losing might, making hitting these incredibly fast late game enemies and getting hit by them much more consistent. Turn 2, he one rounded the next Corrupted Worm with Lightning, which wasn't the most accurate, but was still strong enough to defeat Gris's first health bar on enemy phase, having been weakened by Astro Storm. Then turn 3, I had Gregory fly west to kill the faraway Bow Knights with Dark Inferno, giving me enough actions with everyone else to complete the routes. I didn't go for a full route in chapter 24, but I got as close as I could in two turns. I wanted the Makaya user to help get the Ukun Basara in the north, but Gregory was still able to reach the center of the map turn 1 with Soar and a dance. He killed the Ballista Sniper on player phase, then swept the Generals and Martial Masters, with the highest Oko threshold being the Generals at 91. Because I Astro Stormed Alir turn 1, Gregory was able to reach her turn 2, defeating her first two health bars with Bulganon into Dark Inferno. The rest of my army defeated what I would say is a pretty good amount of enemies, before Chloe defeated the final Olier health bar for the win. Chapter 25 was, again, not a complete route, but I got pretty close in 4 turns. While Camilla would still work, I decided to switch to Engage Plus just for these last two maps. Mostly so I can engage with my adorable S support partner, but Olier also gives a sizable combat boost. The 15 HP can mean up to 7 reprisal damage, and by having Dragon Olier get a kill to proc attuned, Gregory gets plus 5 to every stats. This of course includes magic, but also dex, which combined with Bond Forager means plus 40 hits. And so, with a turn 1 warp, Gregory was able to sweep the northern chamber over the course of a couple turns. The highest Oko threshold here is the Berserkers at 88, but he was so overkill that he could also one-shot the Corrupted Worms, with a threshold of 96. With a Pure Water, he was able to survive a Sage that outranged him with Thoron, in addition to the Meteor Sages by Lumera. Lumera herself has an even lower threshold than the Worms at 89, so he was incidentally able to take out one of her health bars while sweeping the Worms. 
With both chests opened and only 12 enemies alive, Gregory defeated Lumera's final health bar with an incredibly overkill Bond Blast. As our last painful step in the run, Chapter 26 presents the game's highest Oko thresholds. However, Gregory is still up to the task, and in setting up max reprisal damage against the Venomous user in my turn 1 route of the first phase, he was even able to Oko Sombron using Camilla, with a threshold of 103. This is only surpassed by Zephia in Chapter 23 at 104, the Warrior with Binding Blade's Dark Emblem at 110, and of course, Sombron's Dragon Form at a massive 142. So, the second phase essentially serves as a victory lap for Gregory, as they go for one last route before taking down Sombron for good. Because the game resets everyone's condition after the first phase, I get a chance to switch Gregory to Engage Plus. I got him back down to 1 HP against Fell Sombron with a meal enchant, before getting Dance to sweep the Northwestern group turn 2. The highest threshold here is 100 for the Warriors, with a General with Gaiden's Dark Emblem sitting at just 98. And so, everything crumpled, even before setting up a Tuned, which let him utterly demolish the last enemies as I wrapped up the route by turn 4. Fell Sombron may be out of reach for an Oko, but Emblem Alir's Dragon Fist's arts let him quad while using his massive magic and reprisal damage. And so, while Gregory had to go through a lot of pain to get to this point, I made sure he got to be the one to inflict the final devastating blow. Overall, I found this to be an incredibly satisfying experience, as one of my favorite characters got to fly around, cleanly one-shot everything on enemy phase, and pull off several more one-shots on player phase with Dark Inferno. Staff Utility on top of this made it feel like he could do just about anything, and as I've mentioned with Hortensia, having a lead combat unit with the ability to rescue other units, or even rewarp yourself around, can result in some very explosive turn 1 plays. However, there are many other ways you might approach this build, depending on how exactly you want it to play out. For a more intuitive approach, you could just sync with Veronica for a Terra Reprisal. This saves you several SP blocks, and means you have room for a hit boosting skill or canter. Alternatively, if you're confident on reaching Oko thresholds, you could sync with Sigurd for Vantage, Reprisal, and Canter, with Gallop giving even more move than Soar, albeit with no flight. I'd also be interested in Byleth, trading the possibility for Gregory as a Goddess Dance target for Thyrsus's plus 2 attack range boost. Of course, you could just invest in a big Thoron to always have 3 range. My main concern with this is the hit rate, as I noticed that even Bolkanon with a hit engrave might not let Gregory reach 100 hits against everything if you're not using a hit boosting emblem. Sadly, there's not an engrave that boosts hit and lowers a void without also lowering dodge, so just keep an eye out as to whether something like the Erika, Byleth, or Eichengrave is most applicable to whatever weapon you choose and the chapter at hand. Or, you could go even riskier, forgoing Vantage for a dodge tank sweep utilizing the Lucina Engrave and Survival Plan, which would be another way to free up a skill slot. I mean, this would be incredibly risky, but hey, if I have the patience to dodge tank sweep the Fel Xenolog, I'm sure you can make it work if you put your mind to it. And that's it for now. It seems like reaching big Okos is a common trend for my builds, but I really do think it makes for an excellent blend of a strat that's both cool and destroys everything if you know the numbers behind it. If you're interested, I'll have my spreadsheet with the benchmarks for each chapter linked in the description. I know I'm not the only one to do a Vantage Oko build in Engage, or a pair of Camilla with a Mage, so if you have any similar experiences, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.